Hi, this is Nick Pizai, and this is another video in our series of applied math or practical math for water treatment plant operators. I'm going to share the screen with you for today's topic, which is lime softening or precipitative softening. This is a more ambitious uh, offering that we're going to do, so we're going to have to spread this out over several ser series of videos, and this is part one. And I'll say right up front that you just simply cannot do justice to water softening or precipitative softening with lime in just a few videos. I'm going to do the best I can because here are our uh, issues to try to train operators to do the math and apply the math topics to their own operations. So I'm going to do the best that I can with a sample plant like we've done with some of the other ones that we've shown you. So let me start off by saying that this is precipitative lime softening uh, and explain a little bit about it behind, behind the, the math that we see. So when we take source water that we need to treat, and it contains metallic ions of calcium and magnesium mostly, uh, those ions that carry a plus two positive, plus two charge, chemical charge, it's going to add to the overall mineral content of the water and make what we call hard water. Now water with appreciable amounts of these minerals will be considered too hard by the public. And they'll reject it for several reasons. Uh, pipes and hot water systems such as boilers will become clogged with scale and they'll fail to work over time or become very inefficient. Soap scums will stain fixtures and glassware and cause uh, customers to have to use more soap to get the job done. So they're not going to like that. So typically communities that have hard water supplies to treat are going to uh, soften these supplies. And this was one way to do it with the precipitative softening. So operators are going to use various processes to remove the calcium and the magnesium that they find in the water. And of course, today's topic, as I mentioned, is lime softening. So basically, uh, it's called a precipitative process because it chemically binds with the soluble ions of calcium and magnesium and renders them insoluble so they can precipitate. And so that's why we call it precipitative softening. Now, here's why lime softening works. And I've taken this material from the Hoover's Water Supply and Treatment 12th edition. 1995 Kindle Hunt Publishers, which most water treatment plants that soften water with lime will probably have a copy of this. It might be an old one, but the latest edition came out back then in uh, 1995. I helped work on that, so I'm familiar with it. So I'm going to bring some of the material out here and show it to you. Basically, it says that lime, when added to the water in the proper dose, is itself completely precipitated. And in addition, it precipitates the soluble calcium and magnesium salts already present in the water being treated. Let's think about that a minute. So let's say if you have hard water, if you have calcium and magnesium in your water to the extent that you need to take it out, if you add the right amount of lime to the water, that lime itself will come back out and carry with it the, uh, appreciable amounts of calcium and magnesium, thereby rendering the water softer, which is, which is what you want to accomplish here. So the two precipitates that lime softening forms are calcium carbonate and magnesium hydroxide, and they're written in those, those forms there, those chemical forms that you see. Note the down arrows after each one that I put there. It means that this is a precipitate. This will settle out. This does not remain dissolved. That's what that down arrow is. So these precipitates are easily removed by the processes then of sedimentation and filtration. So when we soften the water, we, we have to go through a part where we put in the lime, we mix it up, we write, get the right pHs that we're trying to work with, and then we would settle and filter out that those solids that we've created. So it's a process whereby something is removed overall from the water rather than being something uh, being loaded into the water. Now let's look at the hardness compounds. The dissolved chemical compounds that contribute to hardness to most natural water supplies are the following. I'm going to use a chemical formulas. Calcium bicarbonate, which is written as CaHCO32. Magnesium bicarbonate, written as such. Calcium sulfate written that way, and then magnesium sulfate written as MgSO4. So those four chemical compounds contribute to most natural water supply hardnesses. Now there are others that, that do occur uh, to a lesser degree. Calcium magnesium can also link up with chlorides and nitrates, and that will also add to the hardness. But we don't see as much of that in natural, naturally occurring waters. So let's look at the forms of hardness. Any calcium and magnesium that is linked to the carbonate species used to be called temporary hardness because you could boil it away, but now we call that in modern times, we call it the carbonate hardness or the alkalinity. 
So if the calcium and the magnesium is linked to carbonate hardness, like CO3 or HCO3, it's going to be called part of the alkalinity, and it is the carbonate hardness. Therefore, the remaining calcium and magnesium that links to other compounds, such as sulfates, chlorides, and nitrates, which we used to call permanent hardness, is now called the non-carbonate hardness. So we have carbonate hardness, a portion of the total hardness that is carbonate linked up with carbonates would be carbonate hardness, we call that the alkalinity. The rest of it that's linked up with non-carbonates like sulfates, chlorides, and nitrates, we call the non-carbonate hardness. The two added together would give you the total hardness. Note, uh, iron and manganese uh, that might be found in, in water supplies, like especially well water, is gonna have a plus two charge also. So technically, would also contribute to the hardness, but since it usually occurs in such small amounts compared to the calcium and magnesium, we don't enter into, the, it doesn't enter into the equations that we're gonna use here, especially today. There are secondary maximum contaminant levels linked up with those two uh, ions in the water uh, because they will stain fixtures. Um, there's also some evidence going on that there's some problems with manganese from a health issue, but that, that's not being covered today. But the point is, any iron and manganese that's in the water is gonna be removed by the limes process anyway, and it really doesn't contribute appreciably uh, relatively speaking, to the uh, overall hardness of the water. So we mentioned earlier that we had part of the hardness being uh, associated with carbonates. We called that the alkalinity of the water or the, hard, or non or the carbonate hardness of the water. We have to understand the alkalinity chart. So let's, let's go through this. This chart on the left uh, from operational standpoint shows the three species of alkalinity. Across the top there you see the OH1, that's hydroxide. The CO3 minus two, that's carbonate, and the HCO3 minus one, that's bicarbonate. So those are the three forms of alkalinity, hydroxide, carbonate, and bicarbonate. We run a test for that in the laboratory. It's called a total test or T-test. It provides an answer for the total alkalinity. We also run another alkalinity test called P or phenolphthalein. We don't need to use that word all the time. We just call it P-alkalinity, phenolphthalein alkalinity is going to be a part of, only a part of the total alkalinity. Basically, they broke it down into five instances. Uh, P alkalinity is only gonna be found when the pH of the water gets to be about 8.4 or above in natural water. So it means man had to add something to the water to make it higher. Normally occurring water is usually gonna be a pH of 8.3 or less. So if we look at this chart, we can see the, um, the relationship of P alkalinity to the total alkalinity. See if we got that explanation there. P is going to be one of these five instances. If we go on the first column on the left, we can see the P could be non-existent, it'd be zero, in which case the hydroxide would be zero, the carbonates would be zero, and the bicarbonates would be T. The total alkalinity would be made up of bicarbonates. But now if we start gaining some P, some P alkalinity part of the total alkalinity, for example, if P is, is there, but it's still less than half of the total, and we would still have no hydroxide. We'd have a zero for that, but we'd start building rates would equal two times the phenolphthalein alkalinity. The remaining alkalinity would be the bicarbonate species, the HCO3, and that would be equal to the total alkalinity minus the 2P that occurred for the carbonate. I hope that starts to make sense to you. Then you can go through and look at all the other instances. For example, look at the, look at the, the fourth uh, in that first column, the fourth row. The phenolphthalein alkalinity is greater than one half of the total. If that occurs, let's say, I had a 90 total alkalinity and an 85 phenolphthalein alkalinity. Well, that's not all of it, but it's greater than half. Then you can see the formulas that you would have to use for the hydroxide and carbonate. Let's look at a couple of examples for that to make it, make it a little bit more useful for you. Here's the chart again. Here's some example calculations. Let's say that you're working with a water that has a total alkalinity of 145 milligrams per liter. And you run a phenolphthalein alkalinity or a P alkalinity test and you get 30 milligrams per liter. What is the carbonate value? CO3. Well, from the chart, we see that since P is less than half of the total, the total is 145, half of that would be 72 and a half. So we get 30, that's less than, and they're looking for the carbonates. The carbonates are going to be 2P, two times the phenolphthalein alkalinity. So when I multiply 2P, I get 60. So the answer is 60 milligrams per liter. Here's another example. For the hydroxide, carbonate, and bicarbonate levels in a treated water with a T alkalinity of 120 and a P alkalinity of 100. Well, now we've got an instance where P still isn't all of the total, but it's greater than half of the total. 
but we can tell from that fourth row that the hydroxide are going to be 2p minus t. So I'm going to get 2p minus t or 200 minus 120 or 80. The carbonates are going to be 2 times the quantity t minus b or 2 times 120 minus 100 or 40. And the bicarbonates again would be zero. So that's how to use the alkalinity chart. And so you can you can do any combination of these species. You can figure out what they are as long as you know what the total phenol, total alkalinity is and the phenolphthalein or p-alkalinity is. And we'll use that in some of these questions that are coming up. So you'll have to refer back to this chart. So if you want to stop this video now and practice a few on your own, go for it. Now, this is the chemistry of the lime soda process. Uh, I'm going to put this up here. Operators, you know, we really don't need to know this stuff. This is more for the chemists and the purists, the lab, lab people. But I do, it does point out a couple things for us. So it's worth it to go through it one or two times just to understand what's happening when we start softening the water. And in these equations, we have soda ash is going to be the Na2CO3, and the hydrated lime is CaOH2. So I'm going to add one or other, other of these to the water to begin softening. So let's go through these equations. Oops. The equation show us the objective here, uh, which is to convert the soluble calcium and magnesium in the compounds to the insoluble calcium carbonate or magnesium hydroxide. So let's think about that. Every one of these equations has a hardness, starting out with a hardness. And for, for example, in equation one, we see calcium bicarbonate, that's a hardness, happens to be a, a, a carbonate hardness. We gotta remember that. And we're adding to it the lime to precipitate it out. And we're going to produce two parts of calcium carbonate, which we know is a part, part, uh, precipitate. That's good. And then some water. We're going to make H2O. So by adding the lime to the carbonate hardness, we removed, we precipitated out calcium carbonate. We do that through equations one through seven, or one through six, I should say. In each one through six, we're adding lime, the hardness. Now, note that in equation two, the magnesium carbonate, that magnesium carbonate is formed and more lime is needed to add it to it, which we have to go through equation three. So let's look at equation two. We got magnesium bicarbonate, we add lime to it, and we make magnesium carbonate, which is not insoluble. That's soluble. So uh, it does produce some calcium carbonate, which precipitates out, but the magnesium carbonate is still carbonate hardness. So we have to have another quantity of lime to get rid of that out in equation three. The magnesium carbonate that we've literally made in equation two has to be taken out with more lime. So you can see the magnesium has to, you have to do more work to get that out of the water. But we made magnesium hydroxide and we precipitated it out. Now notice uh, equation seven, eight, and nine. Uh, because in four, five, six, we made magnesium hydroxide plus some um, calcium compounds that are soluble. We had to go to seven, eight, nine to add soda ash to get rid of that. So the lesson here is when you have or when you make non-carbonate hardness, you will have to add soda ash to get it out. Lime won't get it out. But when you have non-carbonate hardness high enough to be taken out to, to, you know, to re reasonably get rid of, you're going to have to add soda ash to do it. If you don't make a lot of uh, non-carbonate hardness, or if your raw water doesn't have a lot of non-carbonate hardness in it, you won't need to use soda ash. You just do it with lime, and a lot of water plants do it. They just don't have enough to, to bother with, so they just lime soften. But again, if you make a lot of non-carbonate hardness, or you have a lot of non-carbonate hardness in the water, you're going to have to use soda ash in addition to lime to get rid of it, get rid of the hardness. Lesson learned there. Now. Here's the theoretical amount of lime required. You got to use the formula for this. If you're going to determine the amount of lime required to soften the water, you're going to know, you're going to have to know the following thing. You have to know the dissolved carbon dioxide, not because carbon dioxide adds hardness to the water. It does not, but it will eat up some lime. So they traditionally, they keep the amount of lime required for carbon dioxide removal into the entire equation. So we're going to have to deal with that, even though it's not a hardness indicator. Carbon dioxide, we're going to need to know the alkalinity of middle grams per liter expressed as carbon, calcium carbonate. And the magnesium of the water also expresses calcium carbonate. We're also going to have to know, of course, the purity of the lime. And typically, lime is going to be 85 to 90 to 95 percent pure. So you're going to have to use more of a product to get the required amount of lime. So we're calculating the amount of lime needed here. We're calculating the amount of product. Then we're going to divide, multiply by the purity of the product to increase it. So here's how to do it. Here's the formula. The formula that they give you for pounds 
per million gallons of lime needed equals 10.6 times the carbon dioxide, the free carbon dioxide expressed as carbon dioxide, plus 4.7 times the alkalinity expressed as calcium carbonate, and 4.7 times the magnesium expressed as calcium carbonate. And you would divide that all by the percent purity. Soda ash and caustic use. Um, not all lime softening plants use the soda ash or caustic in their process. Typically, soda ash is used again when there's enough non-carbonate hardness to require it. If you don't have to have it, then you don't use it. In an earlier slide, we saw that non-carbonate carbonate hardness can be formed in the lime process, and this is, of course, soluble. So after you use soda ash, you get rid of it. Typically, carbonate hardness, the alkalinity, will remain after softening in a range somewhere between 35 and 40 milligrams per liter. So the softening process of lime softening process isn't going to drive the, the hardness down to zero like ion exchange would. You're still going to have some remaining that you just can't get out of the water. But 35 or 40 is not a lot. And so typically, if a water plant also has non-carbonate hardness that remains in the water at 35 milligrams per liter or so, making the total hardness, say, 70 or 80, and they don't bother with the soda ash. It's just not hard enough to deal with. The final product can be handled, can be created with just lime use. But now each, each, um, each community is different. Sometimes there are requirements for hardness. Sometimes they're very high. So you don't have to fool with lime, lime softening process here or, or soda ash process. So it's all depending on your community. But the theoretical amount that you would use uh, is not gonna send it down below 35 milligrams per liter or 40 milligrams per liter. So the carbonate hard, non-carbonate hardness has to be appreciable in order for you to use the soda ash. I also want to mention that some softening plants don't use lime or soda ash at all. They use caustic soda in place of the lime and soda ash. And that works too. There are some benefits and some problems with it. I'm not covering it in this module. This is not part of the lime process, so we're not going to deal with it. But it, no, you should know that sodium hydroxide can be used to soften water. Now, after you soften the water, of course, the pH is going to be very high. You want to recarbonate the water. You want to put some carbon dioxide into the water to drive the pH down to, to get rid of some of this uh, calcium carbonate that you got in the water. After it's been softened, it's going to be super saturated with lime. Therefore, it'll be very encrusting to filters of pipes. If you lime soften, super saturate the water with lime and don't recarbonate, you will encrust all the pipes up very quickly in your, in your distribution system and you'll lose carrying capacity. Your filters were encrusted, you'll, you'll have to rebuild the whole filters if you go too far with this thing. So to alleviate this problem, operators are usually going to feed carbon dioxide to the water after they settle the water, but before they filter it. So they're going to remain, remove a lot of the calcium carbonate by putting in recarbonation. This process is called recarbonation, and it changes the hydroxides and carbonates in the water into bicarbonates, and the pH is going to drop. So depending on how much carbon dioxide you put in the water, you know, it will determine how much hydroxide and carbonates will change to bicarbonates. I mean, you can go so far with this thing. You can do a little bit, you can do a lot, depending on how you want to run your plant. You should know that any carbonates that remain, some of them are going to be removed by your filters. And of course, those carbonates are going to encrust your filters. So a lot of operators have to make this juggling act. How much carbon dioxide should I remove to get the carbonation, get the carbonates down so that I don't deposit a lot of it on the filters, but I can use my filters to kind of polish the water to remove some of those carbonates also. The more carbonates I remove through filtration, the sooner I'm going to have to backwash that filter. The more often I may have to replace the media or clean it up or acid wash it or something like that. So it's a, it's a balancing act and everybody does it differently. A lot of operators, in my opinion, depend too much on their filters to take out carbonates, but we'll have a problem in the quiz on that too. We have to use the alkalinity chart in this particular case uh, when we want to determine the calculation for the amount of carbon dioxide to be used because that formula is this. The formula for that is 3.67 times the hydroxide change minus the carbonate change. And what they're saying is when you carbonate the water, you're going to change the hydroxides from before to after. So you have you have hydroxides in your in your water coming over to the um, the carbonation point. Let's say it's 60 milligrams per liter, and you recarbonate and it goes down to 40 milligrams per liter. You have a change of hydroxides of 60 minus 40 or 20 milligrams per liter. You subtract from that the same kind of change you would get in the carbonates, and you multiply by 3.67, you get the amount of carbon dioxide that has to be fed. So we'll have a problem in our quiz for that too. 
There's some advanced topics that I'm not, I'm not going to cover in this series. There's several of these operational techniques that they use at softening plants. Not going to be part of this module. It would be here all day. I can't do that. For example, you have excess lime treatment. That's where the water is oversaturated with lime uh, and then is neutralized with soda ash along with the precipitation of non carbonate harness with soda ash. You have split treatment in which two stage process. The first stage gets the excess lime treatment. The second stage, which goes around the first stage, it bypasses it. Uh, and is added into the water um, where it's added with CO2 content. So it reduces the recarbonation requirements because that water would have carbon dioxide in it. So it helps uh, you get away with less soda ash in that process. Uh, alum coagulation could also help because some of those calcium carbonate particles are so fine, they won't settle. They're too tiny. So if you alum coagulate them, you can remove some of that calcium carbonate, which would add to you, would subtract from the hardness rather than having to depend on just the lime to do it. What that does for you if you add alum is uh, uh, make the detention time, required detention time smaller. You don't have to be in that detention time period very long to settle out those solids if you have alum precipitation going on for you. And of course, uh, there's a return sludge process also too, where lime solids are, are returned back to the rep and makes to help improve chemical reactions taking place. These are all more advanced topics. I'm not going to cover that there. I just want to do the basics. We'll try to get to those at a later, later topic. Uh, some other things you may want to know about lime softening, these tend to end up as uh, quizzes or part of your um, theory on your exams. Of course, I mentioned that to soften non-carbonate harness, you need to use soda ash. Uh, sometimes you have a total alkalinity that's greater than the hardness. If you do that, you have negative non-carbonate hardness or what they call sodium alkalinity. In water, which is low in hardness but high in alkalinity, it should be lime softened, believe it or not. Generally, the stability of water is going to be greater in which the higher alkalinity, high calcium content is there rather than low alkalinity, low calcium content. Uh, the pH of lime softened water will decrease with increasing temperature. That's something to remember. If you have too many carbonates depending on, depositing on your filter, if you haven't recarbonated enough, you're going to cause shorter filter runs. I think I mentioned that. Also, for solids production, sludge production, for each pound of lime being added to the water, Three and a half pounds of solids are going to be precipitated. So that's something that has to be planned. Generally speaking, because lime softening plants use a huge amount of lime, a lot of solids are produced. They got to have large lagoons, that's for sure. And lastly, operators usually strive to produce a finished water that is slightly depositing to protect the pipes, especially for lead and copper, that kind of problem. So water will lose alkalinity as it travels. And that's a good thing as far as they're concerned. Okay, let's look at some exam data and the questions that I've included. I got 10 questions here for data. We're gonna have to look at some data for that. Uh, what follows is a plastic exam that uses the lime softening plant that I've included. I'm gonna show you some schematics. I'm gonna show you the overall schematic on one page and then I broke it up into three smaller units so that you can see more details and it's harder to fit it all on one page. So I had to break it up. Uh, you're gonna find included some conversion factors that we normally put into our, our practical math modules. You can find a sheet that provides operating data for this plant in the month of September. And you'll need to refer to all of these pages to get the information you need to solve the math problems. Okay, here's our standard conversion factor chart going from US equivalents over to um, European equivalents or metric units. So you can go back and forth with that. I think we've included that in every one of our modules. And there you see some information about formulas and values and some specific information about this water treatment plant that you would go through. Notice that the water treatment plant information was designed <clears throat> to um, operate at about 55, 60 gallon per minute, operate all four filters. Uh, provisions are made to wash a half a filter at a time. I think we did a half filter operation for the Lake County plant. So this is very similar to that. You take a filter out of service and backwash uh, half of it at a time. The sand area for the filter is 14 by 26 but each filter has an overall 32 by 26 area. The filter wash water used in a month was over two and a half million gallons. You see we're using sodium silicon fluoride there. There's the formula for uh, recarbonation. There's the number of half washes that they did in a month. That was 46. To give you some information on finished water quality and finished water uh, alkalinities, the lime requirement, and also the sludge to the lagoon was 391,402 gallons at 5%, and had a specific gravity of 1.06. So that's information you'll need to dig out when you do some of these problems. 
And here's some operating data that they gave us for September. On the left, they have the chemicals used in pounds and how much they cost. For example, carbon, 15,012 pounds at $23 a pound. So these are all pounds. I may not have listed that. So I apologize. It's all pounds. There's some chemical analysis. All of these analyses are in milligrams per liter, except the turbidity, of course, which is going to be an NTU. All they did was give you the raw water turbidity. They gave you total alkalinity on the raw water, but for settled and carbonated water, they gave you 70 and 60 uh, for total alkalinity and 40 and 28 for uh, phenolphthalein alkalinity. They gave you some other information there. They tell you that the finished water fluoride was 1.1 milligrams per liter. There's the plant layout, the schematic. You see on the lower left, you have four low service pumps to pump water. You can add activated carbon there. Goes into a long line, it goes over to rapid mix, then goes through your softening process of flocculation, sedimentation, weirs. Um, then goes over to filtration. You have a wash water reclaim basin. When you backwash a water a filter, it goes into reclaim and it goes back to the head of the plant. That's got some data on it. And in the upper right hand side, you see some planned operation information that's very hard to read. So I'm gonna break this up into smaller sections and let's move on to those. Here's the raw water and lagoon section. There's the raw water pumps, four of them, show you what their rating is. And they're pumping through 23,000 feet of 36 inch water main. You see the sludge lagoons, how big they are and how deep they are. They had activated carbon there. Going on to the next slide, you see this softening area, the rapid mix, the flock and sed basins. Rapid mixture size is there, 13 by 13 by 11. Flocculator size, sedimentation basin size. We show you the weir length per basin. That's important. Tell you that recarbonation takes place at the end of those basins. The line coming in from the top left corner down into the rapid mix, that arrow is, is the uh, wash water return line. On the last slide, we see the filters and other data. You see the wash water return in the upper left hand corner going back to that line I just described a moment ago. And you see the design considerations. The plant was, was in operation for 55, 60 gallon per minute at 12 hours per day. You see the size of the filters, the half filters the filter wash water pumps, and where the chlorine and fluoride are at. So all of that is shown to you, and you may have to refer to those as these problems. So with that, oh, oh well, let, me, let me point this out. I like to, when I do one of these kind of exams, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I like to take the flow rate, which they told me was 55, 60 gallon per minute, 12 hours a day. I like to make my conversions up front. I think I mentioned that on some of the other questions I've given you. I make these conversions right up front. I don't have to keep going back and fishing for these things and recalculating them every time I'm potentially making a mistake. But if I take the gallons per minute, which was 55, 60, I want to change that to MGD. At a rate of 55, 60 gallon per minute while the plant is operating, the plant flow would be 55, 60 times 1440, or about 8 million gallons per day. So while the plant is operating, it's at 8 MGD but it only operates 12 hours a day, a half a day. So the plant total for the day was 4, four million gallons. So don't get those two mixed up. Depending on how they ask you the question, you got, you got to pay attention to that. Trust me, I failed a test like that once. Now for the cubic feet conversions, at a flow rate of 55, 60 gallon per minute or the eight MGD that we just calculated, if I multiply that times 1.55, I would come up with 12.4 cubic feet per second per flow rate. I multiply that by 60 seconds, I come up with 744 cubic feet per minute. So now I have flow rates I can work with. Okay, I've got gallons per minute, I've got MGD, and I got cubic feet per minute and cubic feet per second. So I can grab any one of those four I need for the, depending on how they ask me the problem. Let's go to question number one. And remember, if you want to work through these, read the question, stop the video, work it out with pencil and paper and a calculator, and get back to it. And with that, I'm going to move on. First one is calculate the detention time in hours for the carbon feed from low service pumps to the re, uh, rapid mixer, sorry for repaid, rapid mixer at operating conditions. So detention time we know equals volume divided by the flow rate. I have some misspellings there. It was in a little bit of a hurry apparently. So the flow rate while the plant operates is 55, 60 gallon per minute according to the plant conditions. So the detention time is gonna be 3.14 for pi times the radius squared, 1.5 feet, times 23,000 feet of distance. That's how long that pipe is. I'm gonna multiply by 7.48 to convert it to gallons and divide it by the flow rate of 55, 60 gallons per minute. And they wanted that an hour, so I'm calculating minutes, dividing by 60, I'm gonna get 3.64 hours. 
Hope that's what you got too. All right, let's move on to the next one. Question number two. What is the velocity in feet per second in this line under operating conditions? And we know that V equal Q over A, or the flow rate divided by the area of the pipe. But we previously calculated the plant operated at a flow rate of 744 cubic feet per minute. We did that a couple slides ago. If I take that 744 cubic feet per minute and divide it by pi r squared, I would come up with 105.3 feet per minute. And they wanted an answer in feet per second. So I've got to divide that by 60 because there are 60 seconds in a minute. And I come up with 1.75 feet per second. Remember, engineers like to design lines that have a velocity of somewhere between one and five feet per second. In this case, they've done that because they want ample detention time for the, for the activated carbon. So that makes sense. So let's move on to question number three. Calculate the weir loading rate in gallon per day per foot while the plant operates. Okay, we got to go into our schematics and figure out that information. You see from the schematic that the plant has four weirs and each of them are 200 feet long. Each basin has a weir of 200 feet. So the weir loading would be 8 million gallons per day divided by 200 foot of weir length per basin and four basins. So the weir loading is going to be 10,000 gallons per day per foot. That's pretty simple. That's an easy one, and that makes sense. Now let's look at question number four. If, oops, sorry. If the lime used at the plant was 90% pure, what was the dosage of pure lime in pounds per million gallons? All right, I'm gonna have to dig some information out here. When I go into my operational sheets, I see that the fact that I used 93,500 pounds of lime in the month of September. All I know is September is a 30 day month. So each day the plant also produced 4 million gallons. We know that. So the dosage of product then would be 93,500 pounds for 30 days. And then one day I produce 4 million gallons, or I use 779.16 pounds per million gallons. The dosage of pure lime then would be 779.16 times the 0.9, or 701 pounds per million gallons. Now right, let's do question number five. At the operating flow, how many pounds per day carbonates are deposited on the filters? All right, now we're getting into some more difficult problems. Hope you got your pencil sharpened. Try this one. All right, so we're gonna to have to look up the phenolphthalein in total alkalinity in the carbonated water and the filtered water to calculate the change and then convert the change to pounds. The P and T alkalinity for carbonated water was listed at 28 and 60 milligrams per liter. The P and T alkalinity for the filtered water is listed at six and 40. So in other words, when we carbonated water, we went to 28 and 60, we went through the filters and it dropped down to six and 40, which is what we'd expect things to drop as we go through the filters because some of the carbonates are deposited on the filters, so we're gonna have less. So in both of these cases, the phenolphthalein alkalinity is less than half of the total. I'm sure you understand that. So when you go into your alkalinity chart and look for phenolphthalein alkalinity being less than half of the total, the carbonates must equal QP in both instances. So 2P for the carbonated water equals 56, and 2P for the filtered water would be 12. So the difference is 44 milligrams per liter. That represents the carbonates deposited on the filter. So therefore, if I'm losing 44 milligrams per liter carbonates going through filtration, which I just proved by using the alkalinity chart, I'm gonna take that 44 milligrams per liter and treat it like a dosage. I'm going to multiply by 8.34 and the flow rate of 4 mgd. I'm going to lose 1,468 pounds of carbonates per day on my filters. Seems like a lot, doesn't it? But that's what it is. So if you're using losing 44 milligrams, your your filters are trapping 44 milligrams per liter carbonates at that flow rate. You're going to lose 1,468 pounds per day of carbonates on your filters. You can see what those are going to encrust after time. A lot of operators do other things they won't do as much, or they might put some polyphosphates on there. I'm not going to get into all that. The point is, I want to know how much how much carbonates we are losing. Okay, question number six. Let's try this one. Oh boy, they're giving us the following analysis and they're asking us for cost per million gallons to lime soften this water. Now, let me say right up front that this is theoretical. 
it determines the amount of lime to totally lime soften this water as best you can. In your community, you may not be going this far with lime softening. You may say, well, we don't need to go past 150 milligrams per liter or 120 milligrams. This is gonna do the best job it can. This is gonna drop it down as far as you can get to maybe 30 or 35 milligrams per liter. So just with that in mind, this is how this problem is set up. They gave us the analysis. They said the calcium was 200 milligrams per liter, magnesium was 76, there's three milligrams per liter of free CO2 in the water, total alkalinity was 170 milligrams per liter, the lime itself was 90% pure and it cost $85 a ton. So let's work this problem. So the pounds per million gallon of lime required, we saw that before, we dig that problem out, it says I gotta multiply 10.6 times the free carbon dioxide, which we did in another problem. And we've gotta multiply 4.7 times the 170 of the alkalinity and the 76 of the milligrams of uh, magnesium. Now those 4.7 and 10.6, those are all just atomic weight conversions, adding in this, the 8.34 pounds per million gallon and all that to, to change the milligrams per liter. You wanna go through all that math, you can, but that's, that's where they all come from. They're just, they're just conversion factors that we use. And of course, then I have to divide by the purity of the lime because they wanna know, not product, they wanna know the, the lime. So I'm gonna divide by the 0.9 purity. So the lime required is gonna be 31.8 plus 7.99 plus 357.3, all divided by that 0.9. I come up with 1,320 pounds per million gallons lime required. Now, I'm using that many pounds per million gallons. And I know that a ton is 2,000 pounds. This stuff costs $85 a ton. I can take that 1320 and convert it down to $56 per million gallons. It costs as lime softener as well. Hope you did well on that. Let's go to question number seven. How many pounds per million gallons carbon dioxide is needed for recarbonation in the plant? This is interesting. Uh, I hate to tell you how old I am, but when I took my exam back in the 1970s, you didn't have carbon dioxide to feed, compressed carbon dioxide, which was pure. We had to know how to convert, uh, to burn natural gas to get carbon dioxide out of it. So we had to know how many, how many gallon, pounds of natural gas we had to burn and how, what the efficiency rate was. So, Young whippersnappers got it easy. That's all I can tell you. Anyway, let's move on. We have to determine the changes for phenolphthalein and total alkalinity in the settled and the carbonated water using the alkalinity chart. Again, because pounds per million gallons of carbon dioxide equals this formula here, the 3.67 times the hydroxide change minus the carbonate change. And let's think about that a minute. We're recarbonating the water. We're taking settled water, we're putting carb recarbonation to it. And before that, then we're gonna take that water and apply it to the filters. So the alkalinity of the water, the phenolphthalein and the total alkalinity are going to change. And it's the whole point of adding carbon dioxide. We're gonna change some of that alkalinity. We're gonna change carbonates to bicarbonates, hydroxides to carbonates. That's what we wanna do. Well, theoretically, how much would it take to do the job thoroughly is determined by going into the alkalinity chart and seeing how much the hydroxide changed. We have to dig out that data and subtract from it how much the carbonates changed. So when we go into our sheets, here's what we dig out. The settled phenolphthalein and total alkalinities were 40 and 70. So settled water phenolphthalein was 40, settled water total alkalinity was 70. So would be greater than one half, the phenolphthalein is greater than one half T, so the hydroxide change must be 10 minus zero or 10 milligrams per liter. Hope you figured that out. So the settled phenolphthalein, settled phenolphthalein and total alkaline, 40 is greater than one half T. 40 is greater than one half of 70. So the hydroxide change, according to the chart, would be 10 minus the zero or 10 milligrams per liter. Did the same for the recarbonated. We did that for the settled. Now we went through recarbonation. The phenolphthalein and the total are going to change. They changed to 28 and 60. So you can see they actually went down by adding some carbon dioxide, which makes sense. Now, the phenolphthalein alkaline is less than half of the total. Before, it was greater than half. So when it's less than half, and I'm looking at the carbonates, the change is going to be 60, went down to 56. So that's a 4 milligram per liter change. So to use my formula for carbon dioxide then, I'm going to take the pounds per million gallon carbon dioxide needed would be 3.67 times the change in hydroxide, which was 10, plus the change in uh, carbonates, which was four, times 3.67 gives me 51.38 pounds per million gallon. It's a little difficult. Hope you did well on that. Let's move to question number eight. 
Now they get a little bit easier now. So calculate the filter rate in gallon per minute per square foot at operating conditions. Plant operates at 55, 60 gallon per minute. And of course, each square foot of a filter is 32 by 26 or 832 feet. So in other words, when the filter's in operation, we're not running half, we're running the whole filter. So I'm using the 36 by 26, 32 by 26. And I've got four filters in use. So the filter rate is going to be the 55, 60 gallon per minute going through four filters, each of which is 832 square feet. I'm coming up with a filter rate of 1.67 gallon per minute per square foot. Hope you did well on that. Let's move to number nine. We only got two more to do here. What is the average half filter wash time if the rate of rise is 24 inches per minute? All right, this is an old timer's question. They used to backwash filters and watch how far the water would rise in one minute. And that rate of rise, that 24 inches in this case, or 18, whatever they got, would then help them determine uh, what their backwash rate was. There was no other way to figure it out. So what they did when they backwashed this filter apparently is look and see how far it went up in one minute and it went up 24 inches. So one, one half of it would be 12 inches, the other half would be 12 inches, 24 inches. If you take a block of water that's 12 inches by 12 inches and it moves up 12 inches, that's one cubic feet of water and another cubic foot of water moving up in one minute. So two units of one cubic feet are moving up. So what I'm looking at is taking the 24 inches per minute is actually equal to two feet per minute times the uh, gallons per cubic foot, 7.48. He's washing at a rate of 15 gallon per minute per square foot. And I hope that makes sense to you, but that's, that's the way they used to do it. So the half filter sand area, we're not washing the whole filter at one time, and it says the sand area is 14 by 26. So I'm back washing 364 square feet. So in the month, 2,511,600 gallons were used to make 46 half filter washes. So those gallons divided by the 46 would come out to 54,600 gallons per half filter wash. Well, if I'm washing at a rate of 15 gallon per minute per square foot, and I'm washing 364 square feet to do that, I'm gonna generate a flow rate of 5,460 gallons per minute during that wash. If I use 54,600 gallon per half wash, and I did it at a rate of 5,460, that's exactly uh, 10 minutes. I take the gallons per wash divided by the number of gallons per minute, and I come up with 10 minutes per half filter wash. Makes sense. Okay, and then the last question, I believe is a fluoride question. Calculate the applied value of fluoride ion in milligrams per liter. We're gonna have to go in and dig out some data. And I see that the sheet says 1,465 pounds of sodium silica fluoride were used in the month. Give me some information on one of those sheets about the molecular weight of the constituents of sodium silica fluoride. They total up to be 188 total for the uh, equivalent weight of sodium silica fluoride. The fluoride content of that is 114. So if I divide the 114 by 188, I see that the sodium silica fluoride molecule has 60.6% fluoride in it. Okay. So the applied fluoride ion then would be the 1,465 pounds in 30 days. And each day I'm treating 4 million gallons, so I'm going to divide by the 4. And I know that 1 milligram per liter equals 8.34 pounds per million gallons. I'm going to take all of that, I'm going to multiply it by the percent of fluoride available, which was 0 0.606. I'm coming up with 0 0.88 milligrams per liter applied fluoride ion. And I hope you got that right. And that's the end of our first part of this series. I guarantee you we'll have some more questions coming down on this sample quiz, so save it work these problems out and come back in a week or so and we'll have some more problems, another 10 problems or so. I hope this helped. Uh, again, this is the video as part of the Apply to Practical Math for Operators series. Uh, this was for lime softening. Uh, we'll do some others as I mentioned. This is to help operators with their math and their, uh, their ability to apply these problems not only to their exams but also at their water treatment plants. Uh, you can access more videos. You'll see some um, some icons scrolling up. You can click on these icons and you'll be able to get uh, some other information. You can see some other videos in this series or some of the other series that we put together. I encourage you to do that. Hope this helps and uh, check back for these future videos. Thank you. And we're going to stop sharing from here and close out. Have a good day.